Oh, All right. Great. Hello, guys. Hello, afternoon, day two slush. Thank you for anyone who's still here watching us. It's been, uh, it's been a long two days. So on stage, I have with me four iconic venture capital funds and four young investors at those funds. And I, think, I don't think anyone on this stage, except for me, has been at Slush before. And I think Kleiner is the only fund that has visited Slush before. And also, none of these funds have a presence in Europe. So it truly is a novel perspective that we're bringing in and on stage today. Before we get going, let's do a quick round of introductions or add to the introductions that we said earlier. So each of you, how did you make, first make your way into the world of venture and why are you investing with the fund you're currently investing with currently? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Matias. I'm actually from Argentina and uh, I first made my way into venture because uh, I was at NYU and uh, kind of the ball of gravity is always kind of turning you towards banking or, or consulting or something like that. But I was lucky enough to find this firm called Inside Venture Partners, which is based in New York and hires kind of 20-year-old kids to go find cool investments. Uh, so that was my first, my first gig, and I immediately fell in love with it. Um, and uh, th that's what I've been doing for the last, kind of for the last 10 years. Um, the reason I'm at Founders Fund is that when I left Insight to go to a portfolio company in Spain, um, to get some operational experience, I was in charge of a few things, one of them being fundraising. And through that process, I got to know 30 different venture funds. And I thought that Founders Fund had kind of like the sharpest questions and kind of the really differentiated thinking. And so uh, I asked them for a job. They didn't hire me, but they told me, you know, let's stay in touch uh, and get to know each other over time. And I went to Capital G, which is Alphabet's growth fund. I was there for a couple of years, also doing a lot of international investing. And I kept kind of... Uh, getting together with Founders Fund, and then two years in, um, got to know the entire, the entire partnership and ended up joining in 2018. So I've been here for four years. And really the reason I picked Founders Fund for kind of my, my long haul after being at, at three different firms, it's, it's really kind of the contrarian mentality that it's not just kind of a marketing slogan, it's really proven out in practice when you look at the kinds of investments that, that the team has made over the years, kind of really bold, really courageous. Uh, and really willing to stand up and, and say things that others are maybe afraid to, to talk about. And so I think uh, they really do live and breathe that contrarian mentality. And uh, yeah, I've been there for four years and you know, hoping to be there for, for a lot longer. Fantastic. How about Lisa? Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Shu, investor at First Mark Capital. First of all, thanks for having me. It's been such an awesome time being in Helsinki and at Slush for the first time. Um, so how I made my way into adventure. So at first out of school, uh, I was at Bain & Company, management consulting firm, and so had been working with investors, growth equity funds, and private equity funds, helping them with due diligence. So always was interested uh, in investing and worked on some exciting deals like Peloton uh, and other early stage investments. So um, before going to the investment side, I actually worked at two startups in New York, Peloton and Handy, really trying to understand you know, what was going on at startups and you know, what it took to build companies. Um, and after the second company exited, uh, I decided to make my way over to the venture side. Um, and as a quick introduction, First Mark is an early stage venture capital firm based in New York City. Uh, we invest at Seed, Series A, typically lead those rounds and invest primarily in Europe, uh, US, and Canada. So the reason I found myself there is because I really love the New York ecosystem. At the time, it was still you know, a very small ecosystem compared to the Bay Area. And I had spent you know, my operating years at really New York uh, startups at their core. And so I really love that focus. I love uh, the concentrated model with which we approach investing, um, at the hands-on approach that we take to building. Because New York was such a fledging ecosystem, we had to be and kind of help the founders through those building those networks. So I really love, love the team. And that's why I've been here ever since. All right, over to Josh. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh. I'm a partner here at Kleiner Perkins. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I, uh, I found out about venture a little bit serendipitously. So I started my career thinking I was going to be a software engineer and uh, quickly realized I was not very good at it. So I did a total 360 and instead tried the finance world for a little bit. And I was lucky enough to advise companies like LinkedIn or, or NetSuite on their acquisitions. And it was through that process I realized there's these things called board members and they get paid for their job. And I said, this is insane. Like, I would do this <laughs> for free. So I found out more about venture capital, took the dive, fell in love with Kleiner Perkins. Um, for a lot of reasons, and I've been here ever since. So that's my quick story. All right. Last but not least, Ashley. Thank you. I'm Ashley Paston. I'm a partner at Meritech. I 
first started uh, getting into venture by working at McKinsey. I did a lot of work in financial services, so working with banks, pension funds, asset managers, and the like. Wanted to move from financial services to the fintech side. It's a lot more interesting and watching growing companies and helping them and supporting them doing so. So moved to Bain Cap Ventures. I was there for four to five years doing predominantly fintech, so invested in Plio, out in Denmark, go cardless to name a few, and then joined Meritech in January um, to help build out the fintech practice and continue with B2B SaaS. And so for quick context, Meritech, we're a Series B plus uh, focused company, um, across investing across both the US and Europe, so investing in companies like UiPath, uh, Personio, Datadog, to name a few. And the reason I was drawn to Meritech specifically was I came up against them a lot at, at Bain and really appreciated, one, as trying to follow on to their companies, but working and collaborating with them on companies we were looking at together, was impressed by the people there, the rigor of their companies, and watching how they've supported their companies was incredibly impressive. All right, so a diversified set of paths into venture and a diversified set of investment platforms that you're working at. All right, but let's get into it now. So we're going to start with Lisa. And, and my first question is, like, as was established, none of your funds have a presence in Europe or are originally from the, from the US. And something we at Sasha are very proud of is that you know, we've been part of creating uh, the fantastic growth we've seen recently in the European ecosystem. In 10 years, uh, venture capital invested here is up something like 10x. And we've seen a number of funds, not yours, but, but others, uh, establish offices here. Um, so, considering this, how do you approach investing in Europe? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, at the highest level, it's a very similar set of things that we look for, obviously, across the US and Europe. You know, exceptional founders, disruptive businesses, exciting markets. But I think the nuance uh, for us in particular is we're always thinking about company investor uh, fit. And you know, in a competitive market, why does a founder want to choose us over so many great firms out there? And why do we deserve to win the deal? So I think you know, in particular for European companies, um, we typically invest in and support those companies when they're getting ready to accelerate their go-to-market and commercial efforts in the US. And so you know, what that typically looks like is these companies may have a couple customers in the US. They're starting to feel more, more pull from the American market uh, to enter and really establish their presence there. And we typically see that around the Series A. Um, and so for us, and why that's important for us is because, as I mentioned, we're very hands-on investors. Um, much of our business, both on the investment side and our platform team, which is a very robust team at Firstmark, is building networks across talent, expertise, and commercial or customer. And so when a European company wants to enter, we can bring a lot of value right off the bat. We can help them you know, hire their go-to-market leaders and teams. We can bring them the first set of customers, add that to their pipeline, and also help their executives think about you know, the right operating model in the US. And so that's how we think about it. That's why it's been kind of a compelling reason for European founders to choose us, uh, even over uh, some of the, the, the firms on the ground here. Um, and so we continue to grow our presence in, the, in Europe. We have some great companies who have spoken here, including Sastrify and Pigment um, and Synthesia, where we're co-invested with Josh. Uh, and so we continue to think Europe is a very important part of our strategy. Definitely. So we heard a couple of reasons why you know, European founders should pick first mark over some of the fantastic funds we have here locally. I want to hear a few more perspectives. Maybe start with Matthias. Why should I, as a European founder, take money from Founders Fund? Yeah, good question. I think uh, it's a few different reasons. You know, I think one, one being that if you want to hear really blunt feedback and you want to hear the truth, I think we're, you know, we're, we're really good at giving unfiltered feedback and I think we're not afraid to speak up where others might, might be a little bit more shy. And I think the other, the other really good reason is um, you kind of self-select yourself into, into a network and a group of you know, really strong founders. I think that is by far the, the highest criteria on our list and I think we place a much higher weight on founder quality than most other VCs. And then as a team, you know, we're very small, but we're super collaborative. And so despite you know, who leads any given investment, you get to work across a variety of different people on the partnership who have different, you know, who, who kind of spike on different things, right? And so Peter is you know, one of the great macro thinkers. Keith is you know, a true operator that's been kind of doing that for 25 years across a variety of companies. Napoleon, who's kind of this like, gifted financial mind. You know, Brian Singerman, who's like a, a master strategist. You know, we just hired Sam Blonde, who's a CRO at Brex and you know, knows go-to-market extremely well. And so I think it's kind of a wealth of different experiences. Uh, and we are very proactive about even, you know, re regardless of who leads an investment, making sure founders are able to get exposure and kind of benefit from the broader partnership. 
All right. And for an exclusively sort of growth stage perspective, Ashley, I'd be keen to hear why Meritech over one of the European growth funds? Well, we also are collaborative, so we can work with the other European growth funds as well. But our approach is uh, highly focused. So our motto is being in the market leaders and the markets that matter. And to achieve that, we are highly focused. So we only do one to two deals per partner per year. And our fund is composed of pretty much exclusively partners. And so as a fact that we do not scale, we make sure that we have time for all the companies we work with. And so we spend an a a very large amount of time helping them think through sales comp planning, how to scale from 5 million to 100 million to a billion of ARR, how to go public and everything in between. And so I think it's more having a hands-on approach at the growth stage, which tends to be a little bit more rare with some other growth funds. All right, that's some interesting context. Let's switch gears then and let's discuss a topic that has no doubt been mentioned like 15 times uh, on this stage during these days. So the macro environment. We all know that this has been a hard year and it's marked a sort of distinct change from some of the craze we've seen recently in, in, in venture across both the US and, and Europe. So, so Josh, given this environment, you know, are you currently deploying capital? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give the 16th response during this conference <laughs> around the macro environment. But yes, the short answer is yes. I will start by just recognizing that the macro headwinds are real today. Right? You have this kind of confluence of different factors that everyone's trying to navigate, whether it's energy crisis or runaway inflation and, and rising interest rates to counteract that or, or the geopolitical conflict going on. But yes, the short answer is yes. And the reason for that is because we tend to find during these times they tend to forge these founders that, in my perspective, have kind of even greater resilience or um, financial discipline or really kind of an orientation to their mission that they're willing to run through walls and don't necessarily get kind of bloated and raise too much money and kind of set these kind of expectations up for them where they potentially could fail, like raising it too high of a valuation. So we're actually more excited than ever, especially as others are kind of you know, shying away from investing. That's our time to come in, and that's what we're most excited by. I would bifurcate. I would tell you that like on the early stage side, Seed, Series A, Series B, any founders out there, you tend to be a little more buffered from a lot of the macro that's happening. So you can think about it. This is usually it's uncontrollable. And if you keep your head down, build a great company, set the foundation, and kind of grow into the maturity, it will probably work out. And hopefully things will be better by then. If you're later stage, it's a lot harder. And a lot of companies have raised valuations that are probably one or two years ahead of where they are from a commercial attraction standpoint. So it's just going to take some time for that to resolve out. But that's generally how we think about it. Interesting. Um, for anyone who wants to take this question, like as, as Josh pointed out, like especially later stage round, we've seen a market um, sort of you know downturn. We've we've seen far less investment than we did, um, say in a, a comparable period of time last year. So how long, seeing as there is like so much dry powder in the market, and that eventually needs to get invested in the next couple of years, when are we back to like 2020, 2021, 2021 level of investment per per quarter or per year? Anyone take a guess? Personally, I don't think we'll get back to the 21 levels for many years. Um, I think if there's one thing I could do for the benefit of the venture market is I would cut every single firm's AUM in half so that everybody can kind of re click reset and get back to a little bit more of a rational mindset. Uh, but I think what, what's more likely to happen is that everybody that was deploying these funds in one, two, or three years is going to take more like five, seven years to deploy. And so I think we, you'll see that come down. At the same time, I think a lot of the tourist capital that got into the, into the asset class with very little experience and basically no edge, I think will pull back as well. And so even though everybody's talking about you know, the 200 billion of dry powder, I don't think it means that we're getting back to 21 levels for a long period of time. And on top of that, I think a lot of these firms have also registered. And right now, when you look at the public markets, the risk reward is so much more compelling than late stage venture that I think a lot of that capital will be deployed in the public markets. So my take is we won't get to those levels for you know, maybe at least a decade. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think in the near term, one of the things we're looking for um, is really valuation expectations to reset on the founder level. Um, you know, I think many founders are still operating on 2021, as you said, valuation expectations. And as investors, it's difficult for us to justify those valuations given where you know, public market comps have have, uh, have fallen to. And uh, one thing that's interesting I actually heard at the, this conference is that it seems like the, the effect on Europe has been a little bit delayed. In, in the US markets, we're actually already seeing valuations come down meaningfully, even at the stage that we invest in. You know, I just, we did a, a Series A, about half the valuation that we would have done uh, a year ago. And so um, I think that's going to trickle through the international ecosystem as well. But it's something we're already seeing and something that needs to happen for firms to be comfortable doing new investments. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I think Q1 was still sort of record-breaking in Europe, even compared to last year. It was only right. Q2 when we saw sort of a slight slowdown, and now we've really felt the full effects of, of what's going on. All right, but let's continue with you, Matthias. So you come out of a fund which has some of, as you mentioned, some of the most principled sort of, uh, you know, against the market venture capitalists uh, out, there, out there in the world. So seeing as we've gone through this sort of couple of years of craziness, which has now sort of slowed down, calmed down, are there some like venture investing heuristics which you know you or the market thought to be true that have either been proven very wrong or very right in the in the sort of past few years? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question because most firms tend to have these investing heuristics, which are you know effectively kind of shortcuts so that you don't have to do as much work and you can kind of have a gut reaction to whether you want to do an investment. And I think most of those heuristics tend to be right but it's usually in the outliers and in the exceptions where you tend to find really big outcomes. And so you have to be careful not to you know, revert to kind of lazy thinking. I think one of the heuristics that, that, that's definitely wrong in our view is you know, when you see founders that have been ostracized by the media and by the industry and become kind of unbackable, so to speak. You know, we have two really good examples in our portfolio. Um, one being Palmer Lucky, who was a founder of Oculus, uh, sold the company to Facebook. Um, huge, huge success, and he was going to be at Facebook forever, kind of building his life's work in the, in the VR world, and he got fired for making a political donation, got super ostracized, and nobody wanted to work with him. And one of my partners, Trey Stevens, who's a big defense geek, uh, decided to incubate a company with Palmer and a group of early Palantir alums. And uh, in the early rounds, no, none of the major firms wanted to work with the company because it was perceived to be kind of toxic or, or something along those lines. And you know, fast forward five years, the company's doing half a billion in sales. This, ra- this year, closing kind of a, a billion dollar primary round, which is kind of unheard of in, in this year's market. And so it's, it's gone from being contrarian to being consensus. I think um, it, it's clearly proven that you need to do your own work and assessing a founder's integrity as opposed to kind of just going with whatever the, the current sentiment is. And the other example is um, Parker Conrad, which is a company that we share with, with Josh, the founder of Zenefits that was kind of like publicly crucified uh, when, when, when Zenefits imploded. And um, I think he, he took a lot of the, the blame that wasn't necessarily his fault. And he's a very kind of high integrity person and one of the most gifted product leaders of our generation. And so we decided to fund Rippling uh, in the depths of COVID, and the company has been an incredible success story. And again, just like Andrew went from being contrarian to being consensus, um, and you now see, you know, a lot of the a lot of the investors want to invest in the company. On the flip side of that, I think there are heuristics that I think are really powerful. And uh, in, in in my view, I think the monopoly thesis is one that has always been true in that you see the public markets today, which are the companies that haven't been destroyed. I mean, everyone's suffered, but the ones that have really held up the most are the ones that are really dominant in their industries and don't have like 18 competitors competing away their margins. Um, And the challenge with the monopoly thesis is that they're very hard to find, these monopoly companies. Um, Usually you you kind of have to look where others aren't looking, which I think is tied to the second heuristic, which, which, which I think is very powerful, which is just being really contrarian. Um, and going where others are not. Um, and I think that is much easier said than done. But in this last cycle, I think everybody talks about being contrarian. But I think as an example, the crypto market is a great example of people who were not contrarian at all. And that in the depth of, you know, when, when prices were very low, nobody was buying. As soon as they went up, everybody, everybody was buying. And so I think this is a wake up call and kind of reality check in that you really do have to try to, to, to think and invest against the crowd. And so I think th- those two heuristics to me have always been, been, been really, really profoundly true. And I think it's important to kind of be thoughtful about those on an ongoing basis. Some uh, textbook Peter Thiel in there. Either you're building a monopoly or you're doing rather the opposite. <laughs> I, no. Just to add on to that, I, I, I took the question in a, in a little bit of a different way of which heuristics are other venture capitalists thinking about and benchmarking off of. And something we heard a lot last year was like, top line is everything. This company is ripping. It's growing 400%. We have to back it no matter what. And I don't know. I mean, I don't think that's the best heuristic. There's not a sense of bigger is always better. Sometimes that may be the case. Like you have to be bigger and better to out-execute your clear peer or competitor. Um, but in most other cases, like if you're deploying money into SNM, it needs to be measured and defined. If you're putting money into R&D, it has to be tied to a product or a product roadmap. If you're putting money into DNA, you should 
probably stop, um, among all other things. But, and, but one positive heuristic that has stood the test of time is sales efficiency. Like, I would pay, uh, I pay and pay up for a good unit of efficient sales growth any day of the week. Super interesting. And if we yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just, one thing that I hear a lot, I call it a VC-ism, and uh, this has been proven wrong actually by uh, uh, Parker Conrad, what we were just talking about, which is that a lot of VCs will say in today's world, you have to focus on like one product and one product only, and it's like really narrow sliver, create a beachhead, quote unquote, and then kind of expand out. And the thesis, in my eyes, can be right, but I actually think it can be quite wrong at the same time. And in a world where it's so easy to build a software product, because there's all these primitives around, in which case, if you build a single product and it gets traction, you have like 15 competitors coming after you. I think this notion of building, starting with maybe five or six products at once, going after some coherent kind of single use case and like leveraging the interplay between those different products is super powerful. And this is, Parker Conrad has done this in the case of Rippling with, as a compound startup in the HR world. My sense is we're going to see more of that play out in every single vertical, leveraging some canonical system or record or data, and then building products on top of that. So that's the other VCism that I would push back on a little bit of. You do not have to start with a single product. You can actually be very successful starting with many at once. Let's continue on this topic. Let's continue with Ashley. So I'm curious, if we don't talk about venture investing, but we talk about company building specifically, like operational company building, are there some sort of company building truths or some things you hold to be true that are very easy to overlook or like most people would perhaps disagree with? Yeah, I mean, uh, one would be the importance of growing 1%, not 100%. And what I, I know it sounds unintuitive, but what I mean by that is we all talk to exceptional companies with big visions in, in massive markets, but the most exceptional companies outperform by just 1% every day or every week, and that outperformance compounds ex exponentially over time to become the next Snowflakes or Robloxes or Datadogs, you name it. And that's really hard, because if you have an incredible company and you're hiring top talent, it's just human nature to want to work on the shiny new object or the new product that will cause a step function change in the business. But what actually drives massive returns and builds defensible businesses is truly internalizing and understanding the law of compounded effort and watching that manifest over time. Very interesting. Do we have some more? Yeah, one of the company building truths, as you called it, I probably underestimated when I first started venture is just strength of team. Um, of course, that applies to the founders we back and, you know, We've all seen, I think one of the later questions is, you know, how important is market versus founder? I, I found time and time again, founder is the most important, uh, not only because where we invest, the, the product, the market could change dramatically in one day as the crypto market has, obviously, and, and the best teams can pivot, but also, you know, as it comes to building out that executive leadership team, uh, and that's something we emphasize a lot, especially as Series A investors preparing our companies to raise great Series Bs from uh, Ashley and Josh over here and Matthias, but you know they get incredible leverage from great leaders and very, very not only poor leverage but actually wasted time. You know, incredibly precious time when they hire the wrong leaders. Um, and I always tell my founders, you know, if you hire a CRO or CMO and you don't feel like they're pushing you, you know, pushing you on strategy, seeing around corners that you couldn't see, and of course hopefully not help having you continue to manage those teams, then they probably aren't good enough. So that's something, you know, we try to lean in heavily if, it, you know, whether that's surfacing great candidates that we know from our network that are proven leaders or helping interview and, you know, provide a, an extra set of eyes on candidates. That's something that's proved time and time again to be incredibly valuable. <laughs> Matthias, you started looking too comfortable in your chair there for a while. So I'm going to throw in a surprise question for you. Let's take the inverse of the previous. Is there something that founders reaching out to you repeatedly think you really care about and like really try and emphasize or on the inverse try and hide that actually like isn't important to you at all? Yeah, I feel like you know um, I, I have seen a lot of founders that try to tailor the pitch to what they think you want to hear, and so. It's almost like personalizing the pitch to your fund. And to me, that usually comes off as very inauthentic. And so um, to me, it's like, just, just be authentic and tell me exactly why you care about building your company. Um, that's always going to feel more natural and I think lead to a more profound kind of relationship. Um, so I, I, that to me is something that, that usually turns me off. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what's really important is that you got to build a company that you feel is very charismatic. I think it's something about company building that people usually overlook is, 
you're going to need to hire an excellent team. And excellent teams want to join a company that has a, a powerful mission, but also just have a charismatic story that people feel is kind of a, it's going to have a very so positive impact on the world. And there's something unique and interesting and um, that really wants to make people work hard, especially when things are going through a hard time. And so if you're, if you're starting a company that, that, that it's hard to build that kind of charisma around it, I think you're going to, you're going to struggle a lot more. Yeah, that's a good answer. All right, Josh. So, you know, perhaps venture capital isn't quite as sort of brutally competitive as it would have been 12 months ago. You know, perhaps you aren't sort of competing against each other for every deal out there. So, considering that, how are you currently spending your time across inbound versus outbound? Sourcing? The short answer is we do both. I think on the inbound side, we are lucky to have great relationships with seed funds, angels, founders executives and they'll introduce us to their friends or portfolio companies when they're thinking about a Series A round or a Series B round. Having said that, and, and maybe this will change a little bit in the macro, I don't see it changing much. I find that there's more venture funds than ever before. There's more capital raised than ever before. And we're seeing more preemptive rounds than ever before. And the result of that is that we're just way more competitive. And you have to lean on outbound. I don't know how you get in front of, well, maybe taking a step back, our job as venture capitalists is to get in front of the best founders as early as possible to partner with them. I don't think you can do that just by sitting back and kind of resting on your laurels and, and thinking VC is more like Shark Tank than it is in the real world. I don't think great founders will come to you all the time, and I think you really have to kind of put yourself out there. So I think if we do rest on our laurels, that's kind of the start of our decline in terms of you know, becoming irrelevant, and we're really paranoid about that. So I do a lot of outbound, and it's an increasing amount of outbound relative to inbound. All right, let's go to Ashley. So if I am a European sort of founder. I've raised my Series A and now I want to raise my Series B from Meritech. And uh, I want to reach out to you. But like, what's the best way? How do I catch your attention in your, in your inbox or, or wherever? Yeah, I, I guess to add on also as part of, of your question and how spending time, because we only do one to two deals per partner per year and that's it, a lot of my time is more pre-work around companies that I want to invest in. And so to figure out those signals or as you said, what you want to hear, it's not just one signal or one thing, it's this amalgamation of both qualitative and quantitative signals. So on the qualitative side, you know, have you announced a deal? Have you announced a new product? Have you announced a, a crucial key hire? Have you hired somebody who I know in my network who I'm like, that person's a rock star and you landed her? Like, that's amazing. Or quantitative of how big's your team? How fast are you hiring? What groups are you hiring into? What countries are you hiring them into? And so it's Putting together these puzzle pieces to figure out, is it a company I want to spend time and do pre-work on? And so if you get that email right outbound, being prepared for that kind of company. All right. And Lisa, let's bring you in for the, so the outbound option when you're actually going out and you're, you're sourcing a deal. Can you describe like, what goes on in your mind when you decide that now for the next two hours, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find the best possible company I can? Like, what are you looking for? What, what, what does a fantastic company look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe just for context, I, I think all venture investing is pretty network driven. Of course, there's a lot of hustle as well, but you know, particularly on the early stage, it is very network driven. And so you know, I get intros at the pre-seed from some of the best founders in our network, and that's that's, that inbound tends to be actually a very high signal uh, compared to other efforts that we do. But, you know, I do do a lot of outbound. And um, I do it in a, in a very focused way. It tends to be, you know, in two buckets. One would, I would call, like, sector or theme, where, you know, I'm spending time, like Ashley said, maybe I'm really interested in a theme, doing work on the market, at least trying to get a top-down view of why I think that's interesting and which companies uh, are building the most interesting companies. And so, you know, I will do a, a slew of, uh, you know, these are the... 10 companies that fit you know, the high level thesis on this space. And um, in that case, it's helpful if a founder could, you know, has a medium post or is active or you know, at least has a network of either operators, startups um, in the space that you know, I can reach out to. That certainly helps. I think the other category that's been very high signal is um, both our portfolio networks and the networks that we build with operators. So we actually run uh, a number of online communities, that, which, which we call guilds. So it's you know, CTO guild, CRO go, guild, et cetera. And in those conversations, which I always lurk and, <laughs> and watch those forums, they're always surfacing interesting new software companies that they're buying or using and looking for. And so we've ac I've actually sourced a number of companies that way of you know, some of our best companies saying, hey, we had a huge problem and this, this company solved it for us. And so that tends to be very uh, productive as well. All right. And uh, Matthias, you've become our like, principles guy. So let's, let's hit up one more principle. 
Um, John Valentine, founder of Sequoia Capital, has quite famously said that he cares more about the market than the founder. Like, fantastic market make great founders, not the other way around. So which one is more important? Or, or sorry, like, which one is better? Like, an exceptional founder in a mediocre market or a mediocre founder in an exceptional market? Yeah, maybe at risk of disagreeing with, uh, you know, with the legendary Don Valentine, <laughs> I think we, we would disagree with that because we've seen time and time again that the best founders are able to either expand their markets or discover adjacent markets that may be kind of hard to predict. Um, if you look at Elon with SpaceX, the original TAM for SpaceX was measured in the low billions. It was like the U.S. launch business, and it was maybe three, four billion dollar market with maybe like 10, 15 percent margin business. It was very hard to underwrite a large outcome, and as everybody knows, he then expanded into Starlink, who's you know with the TAM is measured in the tens of billions, if not over 100 billion, and so you know a very crystal clear example of somebody at that level able to take an original business and then do something with it that's completely you know order of magnitude larger. Um, if you look at Nubank in Brazil, also kind of a, a company that originally was just credit cards in Brazil. Uh, Brazil's GDP is like a tenth of, of, of the U.S., so it's hard to envision a very large company emerging just in credit cards in Brazil. But David Vell, as being you know an, an exceptional entrepreneur, was able to first get a super high penetration of the market, which we love, kind of a you know, monopoly of a small market, and then use that to then successfully cross-sell so many different financial products, and then use that to expand into Mexico, expand into Colombia, which is much harder to expand in Latin America than it is in Europe, given the, the re regulatory piece. Um, and now you see Nubank, even in, in this bear market, trading for $20 billion, uh, because they've successfully kind of proven that out. And I think originally you might have gone stuck on the Brazil TAM question. Um, and lastly, you know, FAIR, another great example. I know Max was here yesterday. The running joke about FAIR was that they were just selling chocolate and candles to gift shops. And like, how big of a company could that possibly be? Uh, but Max is relentless, and he's you know, truly one of the greats. And um, now they're doing several billion in GMB because they've successfully entered more and more categories with a model that people thought was impossible to do. And so, of course, like if you're in a, in a clearly horrible market, maybe you're not that good of a founder to start off. So I think you need to dominate a small market first, you know, to borrow another one of Peter's kind of philosophies, and then use that to win adjacent markets. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening in. Congratulations. You're closer, half an hour closer to the after party now. <laughs> uh, we leave you with it. Hope you learned something about venture. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.